our um, representatives from our congressional delegation. Uh, the senators and Congressman Danes was not able to be here, to, were not able to be here today. I'm an editor, technical editor by, <laughs> by default. <laughs> so I'm gonna correct myself even as I speak, I apologize for that. But they, they weren't able to be here today, but we are fortunate to have their representatives. Um, so please welcome our congressional delegation from Montana. Um, they, will each, they will each present a statement from their offices. We have Todd Jackson, the field representative for Senator Max Baucus, and we have Deborah Franzen, the regional director for Senator John Tester, and Dylan Clapmeyer, who's the staff assistant in Missoula for Congressman Steve Daines. Thank you. As Bernadette said, Max couldn't be here today, but he asked me to come read a message. Friends, I'm sorry I cannot be there to support your work in person. Like you, I believe that prevention and awareness can help save lives and save on health care costs down the road. That's why I work to expand access to tobacco cessation programs in Medicaid as part of the new health care law. A clean bill of health is a great reward for anyone trying to quit using tobacco, but I'm proud to say the health care law also includes financial incentives for tobacco users in the private insurance market. The law supports folks who choose to quit tobacco by giving them better access to wellness programs and also giving them a break on their insurance premiums. Thanks for all you're doing to create healthier Montana communities. I'm interested in your ideas and look forward to seeing you soon. All the best, Max Baucus. Thank you. Good morning, my name's Deborah Franson and I'm from Senator John Tester's office. I was just going to say if any of you go to downtown Missoula in the evenings, our office is next door to the Top Hat Bar and it is like all bars in Missoula smoke free. Thank you for inviting me to attend your summit. I'm sorry I can't be with you today and for those of you from out of state, welcome to Montana. Thank you for coming together to address this critical public health challenge. Working together, we can address this threat to the health of Montanans, particularly young Montanans. Unfortunately, in Montana, the use of chewing tobacco is a common problem. That's why I've worked hard to support sustainable funding for the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control. With smart and responsible policies, we can change how folks look at chewing tobacco and make Montana a healthier place to live. Keep up the good work, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Sincerely, John Tester. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Missoula, Montana. Uh, my name is Dylan. I'm with Congressman Dane's office. Um, the congressman regrets that he can't be here either. He's traveling the state for a jobs tour. But he did uh, want me to read this letter uh, to your conference today. So, dear friends, thank you for the invitation to address your conference today. It is a pleasure to have my office represented at such an important event for our communities. I'm excited to welcome the seventh annual National Smokeless and Spit Tobacco Summit to Montana to raise awareness uh, to the serious issues that tobacco use poses for many communities across Montana and our country. Raising awareness and funds to research the dangers of smokeless tobacco is a very noble cause. Smokeless tobacco use remains a serious problem in Montana communities, with many young people beginning to use tobacco at an early age. Raising awareness of the dangers of smokeless tobacco in our schools is a proactive step in order to change the traditional views of smokeless tobacco in our communities, especially in rural Montana. As a father of four children, I know how risk prone today's youth are to use tobacco products. Raising awareness of its dangers in schools is something that must be promoted. I applaud your efforts. If I can be of any assist assistance, please don't hesitate to contact my office. Uh, sincerely, Steve Danes. So, thank you. Thank you very much. We were really pleased to um, have that representation today. Uh, as you know, it's, it's difficult to have people take time from their busy schedules, which we're all overwhelmed with how much we've got to do in very little time, and so we're grateful that you were able to join us. Ladies and gentlemen, before we um, all migrated to Montana, we non-natives, there were the true citizens of Montana, and they settled this land, and we are honored today 
to have them present to you the colors of our country. Please welcome the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes Veterans Warrior Society as they present the colors and I will ask you to stand for the ceremony.
I'd like to thank the drum group for their beautiful, beautiful um, ceremonial music. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, those were three pieces that they played. The, um, the drum song, the, vic the flag song, and the victory song. So let's give them all a special hand. I was told that I couldn't introduce the, um, the Veterans Warrior Societies, those carrying the flags by names, to the gentlemen were not able to make it today. Um, but the reason you don't introduce them by names is because they don't stand here as ind individuals. They stand here representing all the veterans, disabled and, and those that have gone before. Um, so we are quite grateful for um, having this sort of welcome to all of you here um, for this very important summit today. Um, in the next three days. A few very quick announcements. Um, one of the things that, we're way on time now, I can't believe it, we're, uh, we're ahead of schedule, so that's great. Hi Claire, <laughs> I'm getting to recognize people as I start to calm down. Um, <laughs> We'd like you to respect the speaker's time. I know that we have a very, very tight schedule. We'll be moving from one session to the next very quickly with very little transition time. In each of your uh, small group sessions that you'll, you can choose from um, on the program schedule, there'll be a moderator in the room and they'll try to help move things along. Um, so please do your best to be there on time and then to, um, to leave and get to the next session on time. While you're here, I really do hope that you um, get up and move around. We believe strongly in physical activity and keeping your mind and, and body open and, and um, prepared for the information that we're going to be sharing with you. So we've set up some uh, additional physical activity moments, uh, including a lunchtime walk, if anybody would like to join. Jen Geist is the um, program coordinator for the pre-med program. and the assistant to Dean Forbes from the College of Health Professions by Medical Sciences. She'll be here at noon or 12.30 today if anybody would like to take a nice walk along campus. And then we have some early morning activities as well and the Osprey game this evening. We hope you join us. Um, and if you have any questions, the staff at the registration desk, there are several of us around, just please don't, don't hesitate for that. The other um, point that I'd like to make before we move into Dr. Lang's session is uh, the gratitude that we, we all hold, especially from the planning team and all the uh, committee members, is the, the, the financial support that we receive from our sponsors. We would not be able to put on a summit of this nature without that support. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I think it was about a few weeks ago that I had a call with our National Steering Committee and was uh, in desperate, um, pleading desperately for more funds and to go out there and help us with more par partners because we were, we were really short. And in the last few weeks, we were able to raise a little bit more money and the university worked with us and, and others worked with us to partner to bring the cost down extensively. So um, I would like to single out especially the, um, the CDC who funded the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. I think John Robicher is somewhere in the audience. He's the CEO. Um, and they, they started with a, a wonderful grant for us to begin the planning process. And then Pfizer um, awarded us through a proposal process, a small grant um, for a sci small scientific meeting. And then Legacy, of course, which has been the backbone for um, so many of, of these types of events, they initially funded us with some, um, with some money to help us start the planning process. And then when I gave out that plea of desperation, they came through again. So please, a special hand uh, for those three groups especially for... It's, it's, a, it's a noble effort and, it, and it's, a great, um, it's a great thing that they, they believe in, in this effort in looking at smokeless tobacco and not just tobacco or cigarettes and smoking, but as Dean Forbes said, um, the, the whole issue surrounding smokeless tobacco. Um, with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Ling, um, who you, I'm sure, have read her bio. Dr. Ling is with us from uh, the University of Southern California? University of California in San Francisco. She's gonna introduce herself. <laughs> um, again, we're grateful to have Dr. Ling with us today. And 
for those of you who would like to spend a little more time with Dr. Ling, um, we have these knowledge sessions set up during the breaks. And if you look at your agenda, please take advantage of that and, and find time to, to um, introduce yourself and to share conversation with Dr. Ling. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Lincoln. Thank you. Are we okay on sound? Thank you. All right, if you need it. Let's see if we can get the feedback here going. Okay, so I'm gonna put my cell phone on silent. So my, when my husband texts me in the middle, he's talking, say, how's the presentation going? We'll see that. All righty. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. I'm um, really honored to be asked to be here and uh, to have the opportunity to speak to you all as a group. Are you people standing in the back comfortable? Would you, would you like to come have a seat? Please come have a seat. Um, I am going to talk, you know, I'm like a researcher, so I bring way too many slides and I talk for too long. Um, but I'm trying to keep myself under control. Um, can I just see by show of hands? Yeah. Um, yeah. If you have an empty seat next to you, can you raise your hand? Thank, yeah. See, come fill in. Um, come sit right in the front so I can quiz you. Uh, the, um, can I just see by raise of hands for how many people here this is like, your 10 million smokeless tobacco conference and your like very smokeless tobacco experienced. Her, very good. <laughs> okay, and how many people for here is this like your first smokeless tobacco conference? Okay, fantastic. And then the people who I guess are in the middle who are kind of like, yeah, sort of seen it before. Okay, so we have a variety of folks here. So I just wanted to get an idea of whether I'm showing you stuff you've, you know. I assume here nobody is really an expert on Godzilla. So that'll be the one area that's new for everybody. Um, and uh, uh, I will, um, okay, so that's great. I um, wanted to acknowledge our funding uh, for much of this research, which is from uh, the National Cancer Institute, although these, uh, the presentation does not represent the views of the uh, NIH. Certainly not the part about Godzilla. Um, okay. So uh, I wanted to do my thanks up front. Uh, we have a very large team. Uh, and uh, the research that you'll see t uh, this morning is uh, in part uh, would not happen because of, uh, without the support of people like Dan Glantz. Uh, three of my team members, uh, Lucy Popova, Anna Kostigata, and Rachel Grana are here at the conference today as well as uh, Jane Lewis, my partner from Rutgers. Um, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge those as well as all the people whose photos um, I stole from the web. They're not stolen there. They have the Creative Commons license, but still. Many people on Flickr will be featured here. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about Godzilla. Godzilla is uh, an iconic monster, right? Uh, came uh, to be known in the 1950s um, and uh, is uh, a monster who's pretty special. Uh, of course, known from Japan, but you know, pretty indestructible and um, wreaks incredible havoc. Um, really not a force of good or evil, really just comes from the ocean and wreaks incredible havoc. And then after a while, you know, kind of lies dormant and everyone forgets about him. And you think, oh, this, you know, not, not such a big deal. And I kind of feel like in the smokeless tobacco or in the tobacco world, we're sort of in the dormant Godzilla phase right now. But as you begin to think, oh, the waters are very calm and that little thing in the corner is not going to bother us, um, sooner or later, you know, the monster rises up and destroys everything. Um, and so, uh, in part, um, some of the work that we've been doing has been to kind of understand what Godzilla is about and to give us some tools uh, to fight against this force. So, um, we're talking about uh, smokeless tobacco use today. And uh, you can see here that cigarette use, uh, this is data, uh, from SAMHSA, uh, cigarette use has been going down among youth pretty consistently over time, and smokeless tobacco use has been staying kind of the same for many years. Um, and if you look, this is Surgeon General's report data, if you look at young adults in particular, you might notice that, well, especially among males, obviously male use is higher than female, and um, use may be going up a little bit in recent years among males. 
Um, and then if you break that down further and you look at, you know, break things out by race, uh, this is data, again, from the Surgeon General's report looking at just high school aged males. And you can see there's uh, differences, uh, particularly among uh, white and Hispanic youth, which may be increasing in recent years. Um, and then you think, well, is there something to worry about around smokeless tobacco when you look at the sales? Um, uh, this is all within the smokeless tobacco uh, industry. You can see that there's been a transformation over the past couple of decades where moist snuff, which is the finely ground smokeless tobacco, has really gone up incredibly over time. And the traditional kind of loose leaf uh, smokeless tobacco has basically remained the same in terms of sales for many years. So there's been sort of a transformation in the type of product that's been sold. Um, and then if you look at the marketing expenditures, and this is data from the FTC, um, you can see that that's also increased quite dramatically over the past 20 years. And uh, these are in millions of dollars. And uh, you know, the, right now, um, the latest data we have is maybe a little bit less than the max around you know, 548 million. But still, you can see there's a huge difference compared to the 1980s in how much is being spent to promote smokeless tobacco. Um, and the other major transformation we've had in the past couple of years is that it's been really transformed into the smokeless tobacco market. So you now have the application of cigarette brands, like Camel, being applied to smokeless tobacco products. So here, in addition to Camel cigarettes, you'll see Camel um, Snooze, uh, which is a smokeless uh, product with a Camel brand, as well as these dissolvable products, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but these sticks, strips, and orbs. Uh, all bearing the same brand name. And really, this is the first time we've really seen uh, cigarette brands, really powerful cigarette brands, being applied to smokeless tobacco products. Um, we see the same thing for Philip Morris, are now under Altria, uh, which you know, in recent years acquired both the U.S. smokeless tobacco company, which has the largest share of the smokeless market, and they also bought the cigarette company, and so they now also own the Black Hat now and quite a wide variety of tobacco products, which means that the emphasis on um, all tobacco is really appropriate. Um, and then just to put the kind of numbers into perspective, so these are the same numbers on the left here that I just showed you of the um, smokeless tobacco marketing budget going up over time. But it's absolutely dwarfed once you begin to think of the kinds of numbers the cigarette companies are used to playing with, right? So the cigarette marketing budgets are in the you know, $8 billion kind of range. So uh, it really dwarfs. And what you think is that you know, the companies now involved in smokeless tobacco marketing have a lot more money to play with, even though they report they're not spending so much on smokeless tobacco. Um, you know, they, they do have quite a bit of funds um, that the smokeless tobacco companies didn't have. And you see ads are kind of like this coming out, where you have the same company promoting, you know, both your smokeless um, Grizzly and your cigarettes in the same mailer. Um, both of these uh, brands are owned by the same tobacco company. And again, owning a variety of tobacco products allows them to perhaps more efficiently use their funds. Um, and uh, I don't know if they report this as smokeless tobacco spending or cigarette spending, um, but uh, it certainly opens up those possibilities. So where you used to have two kinds of companies fighting was kind of Godzilla versus King Kong, right? Smokeless tobacco companies versus the, uh, the uh, cigarette companies. Now what we have is kind of you know, smokeless Godzilla and King Kong playing together. Um, I was trying to look for King Kong in a Godzilla suit. It's hard to find that kind of picture on Flickr. Uh, but anyways, you have these two companies now working together, playing together, and uh, this gives us a very formidable foe. Uh, and then you also have this message that Godzilla has changed. Um, you know, don't really worry about Godzilla because, you know, he's really not, um, really not a threat. Um, and, uh, you know, Godzilla is now, uh, you know, getting into the business of smokeless tobacco because of this idea of harm reduction. So, you know, smokeless tobacco is safer than cigarettes and we're just promoting the use of smokeless products because, it's, because they're safer than cigarettes and, and really because the tobacco companies have your best interests at heart, um, you know, uh, you should just go along with them. Um, so this is a, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of different kinds of, of data. So this is a slide that's taken from R.J. Reynolds' uh, Investors Day conference last November. And you should sign up for these conferences and watch them. They're very entertaining. Um, and this is what R.J. Reynolds talks about 
uh, in terms of their approach to smokeless tobacco. And they have this idea that they're calling migration. And migration is where you take smokers and you get them over time slowly to switch to, um, to smoke-free products. And the reasons for this, they say, are consumer demand. Um, a lot of it has to do with there's fewer places to smoke, and so you can offer um, smokeless tobacco as an alternative. And then also this idea of harm reduction, where you, know, you can be moving them to these, the safer products because we all know that R.J. Reynolds really has the safety of tobacco users um, at its heart. <laughs> um, so now when you think about um, who the argument for harm reduction is really that there are smokers who will never quit. And they'll never stop smoking. And if you're going to deal with these smokers who cannot quit, what you should do is give them a smokeless product instead, because at least then they won't get pulmonary disease from their tobacco use. And so the core of you know, the harm reduction argument is, one, that there are smokers who cannot and will not ever quit. And we can think of cases like that. And two, that if you um, offer smokeless tobacco to those inveterate smokers, you will reduce harm in society. So therefore, when you think about the marketing, the first thing you learn is like, who's your target audience? Who are you speaking to? Right? Who's the intended recipient of the message? And what's the message for them? So if you're thinking about reaching smokers who can't quit, you might create an ad that's sort of like this. right? So this is Lisa. This is a testimonial ad um, for Verena Clean, where Lisa, the smoker, says, I honestly love smoking. I honestly didn't think I would ever quit. So this might be framed as an ad that's for the smoker who cannot quit the target of a harm reduction message. Um, uh, now, this is the Camel Snooze advertising uh, from 2010. And you, know, you can decide for yourself, even as not an expert in marketing, whether or not uh, this, uh, this advertisement is intended for Lisa. Um, you know, and here it talks about breaking free, going to the concert, getting your t-shirts, um, getting caught in the rain. And um, to me, this is really a different target audience than the smoker who cannot quit. Um, if that one was too hard for you, how about this one? This one you can tell, really, this one's really for Lisa, right? Um, so, you know, there's certainly the tobacco companies have a lot of experience in creating ads that appeal to young people and perhaps not just smokers who cannot quit. Um, and this is actually something that the tobacco companies have done for decades, right? So this is an ad from the 1950s from Pinkerton Tobacco Company. This is old chewing tobacco uh, 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 and uh, really respectfully named uh, product, uh, Red Man. And um, even in the 50s, you know, the tobacco companies were trying to do things to recruit young people. This, this particular ad offers your free baseball cap and your, and your free baseball cards with your uh, chewing tobacco. Um, but even so, by the mid-60s, uh, tobacco companies realized that they had a major problem. And that was that 58% of smokeless tobacco users were f age 55 or older. So um, this was becoming increasingly the product use of older men. And if you have a viable company, you know, this is a problem. So uh, what happened was, uh, you know, at, at least at U.S. Smokeless Tobacco, they got together all their smart people. And they had this meeting in the mid-1960s. And they had all the vice presidents in the New York office meet with the research directors and the scientists and the marketing people. And um, this is a tobacco industry document. So UCSF has you know, a collection of um, 70, 80 million pages of previously secret documents. And part of the research that I do is read through the documents and try to learn about Godzilla um, in them. And uh, this is uh, an example of such a document. So these are the meeting uh, minute, minutes from the meeting, not word for word. And um, one of the things that was expressed at this meeting uh, from one of the vice presidents is that what they really need to do, and this was in the 60s, is we must sell the use of uh, tobacco in the mouth and appeal to young people. And they really hope to start a fad. So this is something they recognized a long time ago. Um, and uh, subsequently after that, they developed this product. This is called Happy Days. Uh, this was the first kind of raspberry flavored uh, chewing tobacco. It's delicious. Uh, and it was marketed for you guys just starting out. Um, and uh, how did this product do? It did great. They actually noticed they had outstanding initial success, especially among younger men. And this is what the whole point that they were trying to do, was get young people to, to start using this product. Uh, subsequent to that, they came out with another product um, in the 70s called Good Luck. And this is where they took the smokeless tobacco um, 
uh, from Happy Days Mint, and they put it in a little bag. That makes it even easier to use, right? Because it's not floating around your mouth. That's hard to do. Um, and so the pouches started to be introduced in the late 70s. They got this idea from Sweden, um, and uh, you, you'll see that uh, they love getting ideas from Sweden. Um, uh, a decade later, they still uh, pursue this kind of strategy uh, where they say that you know, mint-flavored smokeless tobacco is the best, um, has the greatest potential for success due to its appeal to what they're calling the undoctrinated, uh, undoctrinated smokeless tobacco user. That's the new user. Um, and at that time, they were introducing this new product, Skull Bandit's Mint. And this is the, what they call the primary sampling vehicle, which is the thing you give away as a free sample. So here's an example of the Skull Bandit's free sample. Um, mint smokeless tobacco, so it's flavored, and it comes in that little pouch, because again, flavorings and pouches are both things that really make it easy for young people to start using the product. Um, so by now, here's um, a more recent picture of Skoll. Um, Skoll now has 38 line extensions uh, in a wide variety of flavors, not just raspberry and not just mint. Um, and really, for this brand, 81% of their sales are from flavored products. So Skoll is really the to, uh, the flavored tobacco king um, here, but this has been a, pro um, a strategy that started many decades ago and has really flourished over time. Um, uh, Crystal Navel published uh, in the past year uh, some of this data where she analyzed the sales data from the Nielsen, uh, uh, sorry, from Nielsen's uh, scanner data. And basically here it shows that overall, the smokeless tobacco market is about 55% flavored products, and that really didn't change much over time. And you can see the most popular flavors are actually these wintergreen and mint flavors, which might be seen as sort of analogous to menthol cigarettes. Um, and then the fruit flavors are, are much smaller, but still present. So um, now we know that on the left here, you have flavored cigarettes, right? Flavored cigarettes were banned because of appeal to youth, um, but um, flavored smokeless tobacco is still okay. Because um, there's an exception for this product. This is a problem. Um, the pouches we mentioned uh, that make it also easy for, um, for kids to start have also really proliferated. So where you started with a, a single product that came in a pouch, you now have most of the smokeless tobacco brands uh, available in the pouch. And this is an ad for smokeless pouches, uh, for school pouches. Um, and then again, from uh, uh, Dr. Del Nevo's data uh, published this year, um, you can see that the pouch market share over time, again, has also uh, really grown quite a bit. So again, flavors and pouches, both ways to uh, appeal to youth. And then you have like new kind of gimmicky products. So these are um, camels, um, you know, taking smokeless tobacco or taking tobacco and grinding it up and putting it into some kind of new uh, form. So you've got orbs, which look like Tic Tacs, and strips, which are like the dissolvable Listerine breath strips, and sticks, which are all forms of smokeless tobacco marketed under the camel brand. And again, um, you know, designed to uh, increase interest in smokeless tobacco products, even if previously you thought you would never use them. Um, so what's happening with the smokeless market today? Well, um, there are three brands that really dominate the market. We have um, Copenhagen, Skoll, and Grizzly. And uh, from uh, the data that we analyzed from Nielsen, um, the market shares are pretty, pretty even between the three of them. Um, the one that's really come up over time and that's much more popular among teenagers is actually Grizzly. So what's up with Grizzly? Because it used to be all about Skoll and Copenhagen. Um, Grizzly, you can see, has a lot of flavors. But really, the whole thing about Grizzly is that it's pretty cheap. Um, and RJ Reynolds, in their Investors webcast, talk about how the smokeless tobacco industry is, you know, it's growing, but it's also highly competitive. And in part, it's because there is a lot of price wars um, with smokeless tobacco. And the premium brands are offering these value price line extensions. And then you also have these low price brands. So, you know, you have the premium brands are brands like Copenhagen and Skoll, but they're doing a lot of discounting to compete with Grizzly, you know. And then Grizzly, when they were first introduced, really emphasized how, you know, that they're cheap. They said here you could get two cans of Grizzly for the price of one can of Copenhagen. Um, and uh, again, our target audience here is younger, um, you know, not, doesn't have a lot of money. And so this kind of, uh, of low price proposition really works. Now, uh, now, Jane Lewis is going to do a whole session about Grizzly, so I'm not going to steal all her content. Um, but this is the more recent uh, Grizzly uh, 
uh, advertising, which doesn't just emphasize the price. Now, you know, Grizzly is your buddy, and they have this whole campaign about telling it like it is, because we know that tobacco companies always tell the truth, and then says, you know, drive a hybrid, leaves more gas for us. Uh, so clearly a positioning of a particular type of person uh, who uses the product and clearly doesn't drive a hybrid. Um, there's also this emphasis on um, people who are price sensitive are also sensitive, as we know, to th things like sweepstakes and giveaways and ways to win luxury items. And all the smokeless tobacco um, products have these, and actually the cigarettes too, have these kind of giveaways. So, you know, Grizzly, in addition to telling you that, you know, you don't have to drive a hybrid, also says you don't need a vacation, you need a man cave. And lucky for you, they're also giving away the man cave. So, this was the man cave giveaway, uh, uh, again, presented at R.J. Reynolds Investors Conference. And, you know, it looks pretty sweet. You've got the flat screen TVs, the foosball table, the comfy chairs. Um, and again, this is a very, you know, specifically designed promotion to appeal to a certain target audience. Um, not to be left behind, you know, Marlboro Snooze also has, you know, their sweepstakes and giveaways. And on their website, uh, all of these things usually come in the direct mail to your house or you get emails, and then all of these things direct you to the website, which is where you enter the contest. So here for Marlboro's Snooze Challenge, you can win every week a new prize. This happened to just to be the Harley Davidson week. Um, and then you can also um, get more and more chances to win the grand prize, which was you know, trips to the Marlboro Ranch. Right? Marlboro Ranch is here in Montana, isn't it? Yeah, so we, <laughs> we should have a field trip. All right, so. Um, and then Camel, not to be left behind, you know, Camel snooze marketing and cigarette marketing is all mixed up, uh, but Camel also offers um, a bunch of races and, and prizes, um, and you have to go to camel.com, uh, again, to sign up for these things. So a lot of, you have both low prices, and you have a lot of these kind of promotional and sweepstakes appeals, which are all kind of designed to reach the price-sensitive consumer. Um, and using the direct mailing list is something that R.J. Reynolds thought about way back when they were thinking of getting into the smokeless tobacco business. So this is an internal document where they were thinking about, should we buy Conwood Smokeless Tobacco Company? And one of the things they thought about was, you know, well, we would have this opportunity to take one of RAI, Reynolds American's brand names, and put it into moist smoke, you know, like Lucky Strike, Camel, or Winston. And you can see they ended up doing Camel for that. And they also mentioned, you know, we also have this database of smokers. So the cigarette companies have millions and millions of smokers on a mailing list. And they thought, oh, we have this database of smokers that we can, you know, help us improve the identification of now dual users, right? So they have actually unprecedented access to smokers to help, you know, uh, sell smokeless tobacco. So this is something that, you know, they've known about, again, for, for quite some time. Um, so what you have then is this, the, all of these cigarettes and smokeless tobacco products here are owned by the same company. And um, Reynolds now has the ability to sell both smokeless tobacco products like Grizzly and Camel Snooze and their cigarettes, kind of using the same database um, of millions of smokers um, and uh, potentially expanding that market in a very seamless way. Okay. Um, now, Philip Morris, or now Altria, also has the same idea where they're marketing both the, uh, the smokeless product Marlboro Snooze uh, to their smokers. And this is an older ad, but it does kind of suggest that the Marlboro Snooze package, you know, fits right alongside your cigarettes. It's designed to fit right next to your pack of cigarettes um, in your pocket. And then Jane always points this out here. It says, when smoking isn't an option, uh, reach for Marlboro Snooze. Um, you can also see because the font here is so funny that if you look at this quickly, and who really studies the ads besides crazy people like me, um, it really, when you read it quickly, it says, when smoking, reach for Marlboro Snooze, because your eye kind of just skips over the, the uh, isn't an option there. So um, again, this is uh, advertising that's really smokeless tobacco promoted to smokers. Um, and you know, you might say this is not that big a problem, but some of these messages really may undermine quit attempts by smokers. So this is an ad campaign that um, R.J. Reynolds has run for several years now, but they update the year every year. So this is the 12th, sorry, this is the 2013. And uh, I got excited. Um, so uh, this is uh, an ad that they run right around in December, January, right around the end of the year where we know smokers make, often make a New Year's resolution to quit smoking. And this suggests that you can make your smoke-free resolution switch to Camel Snooze as your New Year's resolution. Um, 
And again, because this is positioned right at the time when smokers are thinking about quitting, the intended audience is not the inveterate smoker who can't quit. This is the smoker who's thinking about quitting. And it's putting the smokeless tobacco right there as an alternative to making that quit. This kind of message, again, is a problem to reach smokers. Um, so we actually did a study that was uh, published earlier this year. I know you all had time to read it um, on the way here. Um, but uh, we did look at alternative tobacco, tobacco use among smokers to see, well, you know, um, what's the association? And uh, we had a sample, national sample, uh, from Knowledge Networks, and they're all smokers. We had 1,800, a little over 1,800 of them. They were either current smokers or people who'd quit within the past year or two, um, recently quit smokers. And we basically just asked, uh, in this study, we just asked about their use of alternative tobacco products. So that included smokeless tobacco, loose leaf, snooze, dissolvables, and we also asked about e-cigarettes, um, although I'm not talking about e-cigarettes today. That's like a whole other conference. Um, but, um, and you can see here uh, the reported uh, ever use of alternative tobacco products among smokers. It's about 14, 15% um, for all the smokeless products. Snooze, considering it was introduced pretty recently, is up there with those other products. Dissolvables still quite low. 2.9%, uh, but this product is only still in test markets. I think R.J. Reynolds just mentioned, uh, announced yesterday that they're not going to expand it beyond their, in the near future. Um, and then higher rates of use among, for e-cigarettes. Um, and so for any alternative tobacco product, about 38% of the smokers in our sample had used, had used one of the products. Um, we also asked if you've ever thought about trying to quit uh, by switching to smokeless tobacco. And it turns out that a minority have. So about 8% said they had actually tried to quit by switching to smokeless, and another like 6% or so said so that they'd considered it. So the thought has crossed their mind, although most of the people you know, hadn't tried to quit by switching to smokeless, um, which is actually good because there wasn't any evidence that it actually helps you quit um, smoking. Um, but the intention to quit um, by using the alternative tobacco products was significant. So, Though we don't have data on if you actually quit using, smoking, uh, using smokeless tobacco, if you had used snus, you definitely had increased odds of intending to quit smoking in the next six months. In fact, if you'd used any of the alternative tobacco products, you had significantly greater odds of intending to quit in the next six months. So what does this tell us? It tells us that people who are using the alternative tobacco products, the smokeless products, um, are not the inveterate smoker who will never quit, right? They are actually use of the alternative tobacco products may signal a desire to quit smoking. So again, when you're thinking about harm reduction and you're thinking about that smoker who may never quit, really the, the people who are using the products are the ones who actually are interested in quitting, um, not the ones who are hopeless. Um, we also asked this question about if you're open to smokeless tobacco use, and we, this is, uh, was programmed on the web, so it looked prettier than this, but um, we asked on the nine-point scale, like how open are you to trying each one of these products in the future, and we showed this picture of like snooze or moist snuff or dissolvables, and you would rate on the nine-point scale. You know, and, and basically, if you did anything other than a one, which is totally not open, we considered you to have some openness to using the product. Okay, so what do we find here? Well, in general, the smokers really not very interested <laughs> in using any of these products. And the results for smokeless and snus and moist stuff were all kind of the same, so I just took an average here. But in general, you know, only 85% of the people picked a one on the one to nine scale. They were totally not interested. But when you ask the question a little different, when you ask the question, how open are you to using smokeless tobacco when you cannot smoke? Then you get a lot more interest. Then you have all, you know, about half of the smokers then say, oh, you know what, I am kind of interested in that uh, for that reason. So when you pair the question with the reason, interest goes up. Now, if you also ask, how open are you to using these products to improve your health risk, to cut down on smoking or to reduce your, you know, to reduce the health harms, then you have an even higher um, interest in smokeless tobacco. So again, how you ask the question is important, and putting the reason for using the product along with the question really changes the amount of interest that smokers have in the products. So, so not surprisingly, right, when you look at the kind of marketing for smokeless tobacco products, you'll see, you know, this is um, positioning snooze for smokers who, you know, where New York City just went um, smoke-free, including the parks, and they, you know, the snooze advertising is for use in places where you cannot smoke. Um, and then it may also not be surprising that R.J. Reynolds is, you know, petitioning the FDA to change the warning label on smokeless tobacco products. 
of, you know, and they want to change it from the standard warning label which says this product is not a safe alternative to cigarettes to this one which says no safe product is safe but this product presents substantially lower risk to health than <laughs> cigarettes. So now this is a real proposal. Um, Lucy Popova, who's here, is actually going to do a little session on this uh, because we tested this too. Um, but you know, then there's all kinds of problems with like readability and understandability of this warning label. But really, it's um, again, this is another way of using the warning label to have sort of a health benefit associated with smokeless tobacco, which, as we know, increases again interest in the use of the product. Um, so now, also safer than cigarettes um, is, you know, uh, the, the the position for harm reduction. Um, smokeless tobacco is safer than cigarettes. But you know, cigarettes are like the most deadly product on the planet, right? Um, they kill one in three of their users, right? Cigarettes kill over 400,000 people in the US every year. Um, so when you're talking about smokeless tobacco being safer than cigarettes, you're setting the bar extremely low. There are all kinds of products that are much safer than cigarettes. You know, the Chinese baby formula contaminated with melamine is safer than cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, the uh, apple juice full of arsenic is safer than cigarettes. Driving and texting is safer than cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, we don't see us promoting any of these things, but this is kind of, this is the logic of saying, oh, we're safer than cigarettes. Um, and, then the pro and then it gets even a little more confusing because along with this kind of um, harm reduction messaging, you have the smokeless tobacco companies getting into the nicotine replacement business. So this is Reynolds American. They've now started marketing this product, um, uh, Zonic Nicotine Gum. And this is actually NRT. Um, and it's being sold differently. It's not sold in drugstores. It's sold in convenience stores on the counter, right where you usually buy your cigarettes. Um, and it's real cheap, right? It's under $3. Um, this is sold from the tobacco company, but it's, um, you know, but it's nicotine replacement, it's medicine, right? Um, and then this is product not yet sold in the US, but RJ Reynolds also owns this drug company in Sweden, right, Nikonovum. And they have this product in Sweden, which this is not gold bandits. This is not snooze. This is a nicotine replacement product that comes in a pouch that looks just like smokeless tobacco product, but this again is a nicotine replacement product. And so you can see the line between the tobacco product and the NRT is really becoming quite blurry. It's going to become very confusing for the consumer. On, are you buying a tobacco product or are you buying a nicotine product? Um, and of course it's all sold by your same uh, friendly company. Um, Philip Morris is doing the same thing with producing, you know, these increasingly medicinally kind of looking, again, this is a tobacco product. This is a um, Verve is a tobacco disc um, that I think doesn't dissolve completely, um, but again looks very medicinal. Um, and then the, and again, uh, Altria in Denmark, not in the US, is starting to market this, not chewing tobacco gum. No, it is chewing, not tobacco chewing gum. Chewing tobacco gum, which is a tobacco product, um, which is different from NRT because it's tobacco product. Um, and uh, it's called Chew. Uh, it's going to be marketed in Denmark. Uh, and again, the confusion I think for consumers among which product is the nicotine replacement and which is the tobacco product um, is, is going to be increased. They're going to have more of these new products and it's going to become very um, confusing. Um, and this is all because, you know, Godzilla really is not that big a problem. He's so cute. So this is like the new Godzilla. Um, uh, you know, selling these these products, and uh, really, you should just trust them because they're a drug company in addition to a tobacco company, and uh, have you know harm reduction in mind. Um, and uh, again, this is kind of the remaking of Godzilla and the tobacco industry into the, like the said gentler, kinder, kinder um, purveyor of both of nicotine. Um, so, uh, in doing some of this tobacco research, um, just to summarize a little bit, what have we learned here? Um, we do know that smokers are really being targeted very aggressively by smokeless tobacco marketing. Um, and we know that the messages really emphasize situational use. You know, we're not seeing messages of, you know, quit smoking completely and switch to smokeless tobacco. Nor are we seeing, you know, smoke, uh, cigarettes going off the market and leaving us with smokeless products. You really have this, when you can't smoke, use smokeless tobacco message. Um, and some of these messages like, you know, switch to smokeless on New Year's, instead of quitting, um, really may undermine cessation attempts. And this is, again, a problem. Um, 
And really, when we see the appeal for the smokeless tobacco, the appeal is really strongest for the potential quitters, not the inveterate smokers. So the people most interested in the alternative tobacco products are people who are thinking about quitting. Um, and so the messaging is really not consistent with harm reduction. It's not consistent with this idea that, well, this person's never going to quit smoking, so they might as well use smokeless. The message is really, you know, you're thinking about quitting. Why don't you use smokeless? Okay, so what do we do? So whenever I do these presentations about marketing, we get all depressed because tobacco companies have so much money and they have all this fancy advertising. We think about, well, what do we do? Um, so here's a couple things we can do. One is that we do have data. Right, so we do have research, we have data, we can use this research you know, to, um, to help fight against uh, the tobacco companies. So what kind of data do we have? Well, we have data from the documents. And again, it's taken my colleague, Anna Castigna, like two years to actually read all the documents and get the paper together. But once you have the tobacco company's actual words talking about their product, it's pretty hard to refute. So this is a document from, you know, from Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company way back in the 80s you know, where they, they basically say internally that flavored smokeless tobacco products, you know, they internally call them candy dips. Um, and they say that, this, you know, that really using this product is like sucking on candy. Internally, they totally know this is a product for beginners, for new users, and to recruit kids to use the product. Um, they even also say internally that, you know, experienced dippers reject these, these flavored products. So when you have evidence from the documents, you can put it out there, you can use that to help again, move policy, saying, you know, there's really no reason why we should have fruit and candy flavored smokeless tobacco. It's really just to recruit kids. Tobacco companies have known it for 50 years. Um, you also don't have to have research that, like, is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, you can also do kind of quick little crummy studies. Um, this is a study that uh, was done by uh, my collaborator, um, Jeff Jordan at Rescue Social Change Group, who works with me on other projects. But um, they did a project in Virginia called Meltdown, which was um, to address the dissolvable tobacco um, product use in Virginia. And they did surveys. They got youth to basically do a whole bunch of surveys, not like a really super representative sample. It was a convenient sample, but they, they had a whole bunch of youth go out and do surveys. The survey was not too hard. They asked other teenagers, OK, what product do you think is in this package? Uh, would you try it? And would your friends try it? And they had pictures of you know, gum and, uh, and uh, candy, as, as well as smokeless tobacco. Gathered a bunch of data. Um, you know, so they surveyed, they got, trained a whole lot of youth. <laughs> they surveyed a whole bunch of people in Virginia. So they have got the community involved, got the youth involved, and they found something out. What did they find out? They found that like over a third of the teens thought that Campbell, Cam, Camel Orb were either like a candy, mint, or gum, just based on the packaging, just looking at the package and answering that question. They also found that 83% you know, of the teens um, of the, or the survey respondents believe that this wintergreen flavor, which is a product flavor, is associated with candy gum or mints. Um, and 23% uh, of the teens said they would just try these camel orbs based on the packaging alone. Um, so this is actually higher than our smokers, right? Only had, we only had 15% of smokers open to camel orbs. We had 23% of teens here uh, interested in, this, in the dissolvable products. Um, just based on the packaging. So again, this is not um, the most rigorous data collection, but it gives you something to involve teens and then you can use right away. You know, so this gives you a little bit of data to point to and say, again, it makes no sense why you, know, you can't have uh, uh, flavored cigarettes and that we should also not have flavored smokeless tobacco. So you can do little crummy studies. And then you can also um, do research like we've done uh, we have data here now where we've been looking at messages to counter the marketing. So uh, this is also a study that I know you've all read, um, published in the past year in tobacco control. And we're looking at, uh, we looked at basically how do you make messages that will counter things like, um, like sorry, like this, um, this tobacco ad. So we were showing this ad to smokers and we're thinking, can we do anything to kind of attenuate the interest that smokers might have for something like this um, when looking at this ad? So we had, again, remember this 1,800 smokers that in my prior study I talked about? We had the same sample. Um, but what we did this time is we showed them, um, we had one group that we only showed the tobacco ad. And then we had different groups that we used different, we tried different kinds of experimental messages. And what we did was we showed them, first we showed them the counter ad, then we showed everybody the same ad. 
Uh, we had them do a pre-test beforehand, like how interested are you in smokeless tobacco? Uh, and then a post-test after the whole thing to see how interested are you now? Would you like a free sample? Right? And then we compared the pre-test to the post-test. And then we were looking for differences between the different ads to see, well, do any of these ads kind of attenuate interest in smokeless tobacco? So what do we find? So for the whole sample overall, we did find there were some winners. So there were some ads that attenuate um, interest in smokeless tobacco. And we developed the ads based on focus groups and looking at the advertising and all kinds of stuff. Um, but this was one that kind of surprisingly, this is um, an ad that says, from the industry that brought you lung cancer. Um, <laughs> And it says smokeless tobacco is just as addictive as smoking, but instead of causing lung cancer, um, you know, uh, snuff and chew cause mouth and throat cancer. You know, now a new smokeless tobacco uh, gimmick, snooze, is linked to pancreatic cancer. And so the more kinds of products the tobacco industry sells, the more kinds of cancer they cause. Um, smokeless tobacco, same tobacco, different cancers. So I think we've all seen the um, smokeless tobacco ads that have like really graphic, like, ugh ugly teeth and bad job. I'm not saying that that's bad, but we had used, just to be different, a little bit more of a metaphorical presentation. We also had ads that were more realistic, but um, the ad that actually changed interest in Snooze was, people said they liked the ad with the really realistic picture, the really scary one, but the one that really changed interest in Snooze or interest in the free sample was this more metaphorical one. Um, and then we also had, again, this ad was like not really well liked, it's kind of boring, um, but it was very informational. This ad also changed interest in the smokeless tobacco products. And this ad says smokeless tobacco now designed to keep you smoking. Um, and basically the um, ad presents three kinds of tobacco products, the cigarette, the snuff, and the snooze. And basically says, you know, these are all made by the same tobacco companies. They all contain addictive nicotine. They all cause um, health problems, including cancer. And the point is really, you know, um, the question here is, you know, uh, why does the tobacco industry push smokeless gimmicks at smokers? Basically to keep them using nicotine more often. Um, some smokeless products force you to swallow instead of inhale. Others make you spit, but they're all designed to keep you addicted. And more addiction, more sales, and that's what the tobacco industry is all about. Um, so again, this was much more informational to kind of give you the information and let you decide. It turned out that this ad also seemed to move attitudes and interest in snooze. <coughs> Um, we also found that there was a difference between smokers who've never used smokeless tobacco and those who've used it in the past. So if the smokers had some experience with using smokeless tobacco, the ad they responded to was a little bit different. So for smokers who have used spit tobacco, actually they like this ad better. This is the ad that changed the attitudes more so than people who have, um, compared to the ones who've never used smokeless tobacco. And this is a more kind of traditional uh, health effects approach where you talk about like all the health problems associated with smokeless tobacco. Um, and uh, again, it says here, um, you know, using smokeless tobacco in situations when you can't smoke will not make you any safer. It only delays the day you take action to protect yourself by becoming tobacco free. Um, smokeless tobacco, you know it's not the answer. Um, so again, this is more of a health effects approach. Um, this one was more effective with smokers who had used smokeless tobacco. Um, and then we also did this testimonial. And this was also, again, um, this looks like a little different kind of an ad. Um, I don't spit and I won't swallow. Um, and it was intended to be that way. It's, again, it's not, uh, you know, it was intended to be a little more disarming. Um, and uh, this is uh, re a reference to the fact that the dissolvable in the snooze products, you don't spit, right? You swallow the juice. And we had smokers in our focus groups who thought that was really attractive. It was really disgusting. So we thought we would do an ad about swallowing the juice. Um, and uh, this one basically says, again, um, you know, you, when you, whatever the smokeless product, you either spit or swallow it, or of course there's another choice, just skip it. Um, and again, this was an ad that's, again, it's a testimonial, it's a little bit less um, in your face, um, but for smokers who had used smokeless tobacco in the past, this one also um, seemed to decrease interest in the smokeless tobacco products. Okay, so that's data. That's one thing you can use. You can use research, you can use, you know, publish research to help your agenda. You can also use crummy little studies where you get teens to do surveys to, um, to help you in your fight. Um, and then the other thing we really have is we can tell stories. So, and telling the story is very important. Telling your story is probably more important, <laughs> not more important, but equally important, let's say, to having really good research. Um, because people listen to stories. How do I know this? Well. Okay, 20 years ago, I was on reality television show called MTV's The Real World. That is me in the middle of there, looking much younger. 
Um, and um, this is a show, this is before, this is like one of the first reality TV shows where you go and you live in a house with a bunch of strangers and they film you 24 hours a day for six months. And then MTV takes the footage and they cut it into like a soap opera. And they set it to rock music and they put it on TV. So that's what I did when I was a medical student. <laughs> and, um, and I will tell you that though I have published many, many papers in scientific journals, this is quite frequently the thing that people remember about me. That I was on MTV's The Real World. And that's because The Real World is about story. Now, you know, I was a medical student and I was on the show. That was fine. Um, but I, and I didn't really do it to educate other people, but I learned two things from this show. One, well, I gained two things. One was, even though it was not a dating show, I met my husband. So this guy over here, that's the guy I'm married to now. <laughs> so, that's not sweet. Now, that was, again, not an unintentional. Did not mean to do that on the show, but I did do that. Um, the second thing was, um, I learned um, about the power of a story and the incredible bravery it takes uh, from one of my roommates. So one of my roommates was Pedro Zamora, 22 years old, and he was living with HIV. He, actually, he was living with AIDS while living in the house. This was in 1994, where there was still incredible stigma about being HIV infected. Um, there was nobody on TV who was young. <laughs> there was nobody on TV who was saying, I'm living with AIDS, um, in such a mainstream kind of setting. And Pedro Zamora went on the real world basically to help educate other young people about living with HIV, to show them what it was like, and to show them that you are at risk. Because when he was at, you know, 14 years old and having unprotected sex, he was told that, you know, this is HIV is a problem that happens to other people, happens to older people, happens to drug addicts, happens to older gay men. And because you're an honor student who's the president of the science club, you are not at risk for HIV. And he never made the connection of being at risk. And he said, you know what? When he testified before Congress that year, he said, you know, if you want to reach me as a young gay man, especially as a young gay man of color, you need to give me information in a vocabulary I can understand and relate to. In his sense, being on TV and putting his own story out there was the way that he was going to reach other young people like him. And telling that story and putting that story out there was hands down the most important thing you know, MTV has ever done, in my opinion. <laughs> um, uh, because they really gave a vehicle to putting out an incredibly important story um, that people still remember to this day. Um, Pedro's partner, Sean, uh, 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 who he dated well on the show, is also uh, was doing the same thing. Again, a young uh, gay man who um, you know, was brave enough to put himself on the poster and say, you know, I tested positive for HIV, here's how it changed my life. And having those stories from young people are incredibly important, incredibly powerful, and, um, and a great compliment to the kind of data that we present um, and the research that we present. So what do we have with smokeless tobacco? Well, we had Sean Marcy, right? So, um, you know, Sean uh, Marcy uh, died in the 80s. This was uh, a court case and was written up in the Reader's Digest uh, many decades ago, um, and you know, uh, Sean started using smokeless tobacco when he was like 12 years old. He was a high school athlete. You know, um, got oral cancer and died by 19. Um, and uh, his story was um, again one that I think they they had a lawsuit, and I don't think they won the lawsuit, but the story was really powerful because people would remember this teenager. And so for a long time, when people talked about smokeless tobacco, the narrative was marketing to kids because he didn't know that he was at risk. Um, and, and, and this story, smokeless tobacco causes oral cancer and it's marketed aggressively to kids. Um, we need stories like this to counter all the distraction going on now, all the confusion about new products and harm reduction and all this other stuff. Um, and I think sometimes the stories really cut through that. Um, we need new stories, right? The story from the 80s is fine. Even Pedro's story is now 20 years old. Um, we need, uh, and you are the ones who, you know, work with people in the community. You're the ones who know people who have suffered the consequences of smokeless tobacco use. And you may find someone who's willing to share their story and use that power to fight the industry. Um, what else can we do? You know, I'm very happy to be on a tobacco-free campus of the university. I think making smoke-free policies into tobacco-free policies definitely um, changes the whole environment in which young people operate. Very powerful, very important thing to do. 
Um, you know, continuing to take down marketing tactics that appeal to young people is important. I think there's a session here about rodeo. You know, there's actually been a lot of progress made on getting smokeless tobacco sponsorship out of rodeo. Cigarette companies had to get out of sports sponsorship a long time ago. The smokeless tobacco companies were much harder to, to disentangle um, from rodeo, though there's been quite a bit of progress here. Um, but the flavors, the pouches, the sports sponsorship, all these things that we know appeal to youth um, are places where we can do work. Um, and then you can also use, um, if you don't have, know someone who has a story, you can also use the documents in another way. Um, and uh, because the documents, in addition to having the tobacco company's internal research and internal messages and notes, they also contain these letters from consumers that were sent back to the tobacco companies. And these are the words of smokers. Um, and Ruth Malone, who's a professor at UCSF, has uh, a whole campaign based around, she went through the documents and found consumer letters from smokers uh, that were in the tobacco company files. And um, they often read them at shareholder meetings uh, for the tobacco companies. Um, and again, the voice of the actual smokers is incredibly powerful and really, again, is another way to use a story in addition to using the research. So this is just one example. Um, the, um, what happens is, you know, the tobacco companies, as I mentioned, send coupons and, and mailers and sweepstakes stuff in the mail. And sometimes when they send it to someone who died, the family members write a letter to the tobacco company on the mailer and send it back. Um, incredibly point, poignant and powerful, powerful messages back to the tobacco companies, who then just filed them. Um, and they're in the documents now. Um, and this is an example of a message from, on, on a survey that was sent by one smoker um, back, to, uh, back to the tobacco company, to Benson and Hedges. Um, and um, you know, there's been a lot of trivialization of addiction lately saying that, you know, nicotine addiction is like being addicted to caffeine. Um, but this is the words of a smoker who, um, who said to, uh, to, to Benson Hedges, which is Philip Morris, you know, I've spent the last two months in absolute agony trying to quit. This addiction is awful. I had no idea it was going to be this hard. I think it's unforgivable what you're doing to your fellow human beings. Um, and so you can have people talking about how, you know, nicotine addiction is not a big deal. But when you have the words of someone who is addicted talking about their experience, um, uh, it's very hard to refute. And I think if you talk to smokers or smokeless tobacco users who really are struggling with addiction, it's not a trivial matter. It is not like having a cup of coffee. And it should not be made light of. Um, you've got Grizzly telling it like it is. So I think that we do not want to forget about the traditional smokeless tobacco users. So that gets a lot of attention paid to these brand new products and harm reduction and snooze and stuff, but really most of the market is using moist snuff, right? And campaigns like this, which are designed for those young men, um, you know, still need to be addressed. And we did that study that I showed you was for smokers thinking about picking up another tobacco product. But the next study is on um, what do we do with uh, really traditional smokeless tobacco users and what message is going to speak to them to counter, um, you know, Grizzly telling you like it is. Um, you know, and uh, in addition to the messaging, we have to think about the price because, again, you know, this is an audience that responds to price, um, and uh, there's lots of battles over the tobacco taxes. Um, but keeping the taxes high does change people's behavior, um, and also using those funds to support tobacco control is important. You know, and then finally, you know, you just don't want to forget about Godzilla. You know, the tobacco companies may, you know, change and say we're not, we're not so bad now. We're selling nicotine replacement. Nobody likes us. Give us a break. Um, but you really um, don't want to be hoodwinked and think that, you know, this is not a problem and we can work with these guys. You know, this is the industry that makes its profit from the continuing use of tobacco, the continuing use of cigarettes, and the continued use of tobacco or nicotine or whatever they can do to keep people in the business so they can keep making money. We need to keep remembering that and don't like minimize the role of the industry. Don't let them hide underwater. Don't let them say that we're no longer a problem and we're under uh, uh, and that we're no longer needing to be um, uh, uh, held accountable. Um, because if we do, you know, at some point Godzilla will rise up. <laughs> and get us all uh, in the end, and, and part of our job is to stop that from happening. So uh, here's the simple message. This is always from Stan Glantz, but he says it very well. Simple message for you to take home. Again, all tobacco products are dangerous, and all companies manufacturing and promoting tobacco products are endangering public health. 
should not be considered responsible businesses. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I think, do we have, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Or if people are shy, I'll be hanging. I'm actually going to be here the whole conference, so we can have side conversations. Was Puck really that bad? Yes. Um, I totally agree with you. I think that treatment is a major issue, and we really don't, you know, we don't have nearly so much research. We do have Herb Beaverson here. I don't know where he is right now. But, uh, so the question is really we need to focus on treatment, because smokeless tobacco users often really feel left out um, of, uh, when it comes to treatment, and I totally agree with that. Um, you know, Herb Beaverson is here, and he is like the expert in this area, and he is um, doing studies looking at sort of new strategies, um, and, and so I, I do think it'll be addressed everywhere, but I agree, you know, most of what's, there's been a lot of things said about, um, you know, smokeless tobacco as a way to quit cigarettes, but really how you quit smokeless tobacco or how you help someone who's using multiple products quit is an area that's really important and we really don't know um, what to do. We need more research in that area. Yeah. Right. Um, the, uh, so I'm not an expert in the nicotine content. Generally, when you talk to um, uh, smokeless tobacco users and you look at the nicotine levels, the, uh, the, in the rapidity of uptake, so the amount of the, how fast you get the nicotine is much faster from cigarettes than it is with smokeless tobacco. But the smokeless tobacco products overall deliver quite a lot of nicotine. Um, I believe the snooze products, uh, the ones that are being marketed in uh, in the U.S. as snus, like the camel snus, have less nicotine than some of the other um, pouch products like the Copenhagen and the Skoll, or Swedish snus supposedly has more nicotine than that product. We also know that, you know, R.J. Reynolds has been kind of tuning the level of nicotine and changing it over time um, and changing the size of the pouches so they're delivering more nicotine, but we don't really know um, for any individual product, you know, exactly what the content is because they're able to just change it over time. Um, but uh, the overall nicotine uh, amount is, is felt to be pretty comparable to, uh, to smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the question was, are the counter ads available? So when we developed the counter ads, uh, we did it with the licensing so that it actually can be used by anybody. Um, I'm happy to send you more higher quality copies of those ads. Um, there are, uh, if you go to, I know you're all going to go look up that article in tobacco control right away. Um, but uh, on the electronic version of the article, there's a PowerPoint slide that has um, uh, all of the ads uh, that we tested in it. And I'm happy to, we designed them so that people can kind of just take the idea and then you know use it uh, uh, in their own in their own campaigns or or you know the ads are really designed more to be like a print ad for a certain idea, not like you know the be all and end all of it. Yeah. Um, so the oh there is there's a microphone somewhere. Um, so the question is, uh, is there a website? So the, the website, there is no, there is not really a website for my, for the counter ads. Um, the, we could post them someplace um, for you. Uh, the, the journal that the article is published in is, is called Tobacco Control. And if you download the article, they make the PowerPoint available uh, on, on their website as part of it. But if you can't find it, just email me. I'm happy to send them to you. Um, we would be delighted for people to kind of run with the idea. And then the other thing I need to say is if you are interested in the tobacco industry ads in your presentations, you know, Jane Lewis's um, site, www.trinketsandtrash.org, um, is, uh, 
is the place where you can, you know, where this is an archive where they monitor the tobacco industry advertising and post it for free on the web for people to use. And um, that's the source of the tobacco ads that I showed in the presentation today. And anybody can go to this website. You can search for the brand you want. Um, I've been working with her so that we have a lot of smokeless tobacco advertising on that site. She also has a special feature about smokeless marketing on that site. And um, it's a great source for visuals if you want to um, do presentations about, about this topic and, and show what the messaging out there is like. So, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, so sh the question was whether or not we can talk about the next study that we're doing, which is not, so we did a study on smokers looking at dual use, and now we're gonna do a study looking at smokeless tobacco, traditional smokeless tobacco users, and um, looking at different messages. Um, I think what we're gonna, we have, are still in the planning process, so if you have an idea, if you wanna test, come talk to me. Um, but we're probably gonna use a variation of some of the core ideas in the smoker ads but we uh, may change the way the message is delivered to be more appropriate for the audience. Um, we'll probably test some and make some new ones. We're also gonna, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Yes? Is there, the question is, is there contact information? Yeah. We'll get that. There isn't a technical, but we'll, I don't think it's Yes, we'll get that. Okay. Yes, we'll get that. Yes, you can all, since this is not an audience of 10,000, you can all just email me. You can, you can email me. You can email me. Right, great. Thank you very much. I have a little gift for you. You're so sweet. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Enjoy yourself here. Thank you. I really will. Dr. Ling will be here for the next two days presenting sessions. I have a couple of quick announcements for you. Is this on? No. Did you hear me now? There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, there are a couple session changes for this afternoon. Um, there are two cancellations. Session two by Sharon Day, um, Way, Way Binigay Tobacco Prevention and Cessation is canceled. And the afternoon session with Sheku Samba, session number 10, the implements that spit and smokeless tobacco availability, et cetera, has been canceled also. Um, there's also one presenter change. Janet Porter, who was um, to be presenting today at, in the plenary session at one o'clock, she had a recent death in the family and she wasn't able to make it. But the other speakers are here, um, so that session will go on. Um, there will be, there's a message board out there and agenda changes will be posted out at the registration desk, so keep your eye out for those and, and we'll try to get the information that you need, the contact information. I'll find out if sessions are gonna be posted. Enjoy the networking break, and if you could all be at your sessions maybe a couple minutes before 10.30. There's only two that are outside the building in another building right next to the University Center, and that's um, in the Continue Education Building. You just go out the door and turn left, and we'll direct you. There's signs. Thank you, everybody.